Hey everyone and welcome to another video. I'm Simply G and today I'm going to be doing something a little bit controversial. Maybe not for the channel, but for the manga collecting community in general. It's something that I've always really tried to encourage. I think it's part of having a healthy relationship with your collection and that is unhauling it or, you know, getting rid of, selling, donating, whatever however you want to phrase it, um, your books in the collection for series that you don't really want, need, enjoy, etc. Uh, and it's the first for the year, 2021. I uh, decided to get this finished early uh, so I could go into the new year with kind of a rejuvenated look at my shelves. And the issue for me is because I am pretty... Um, dedicated to only buying series that I really love and really enjoy and reread on a semi-regular basis. Um, there's not actually too many titles in the collection that I can actively remove from the collection just because I am careful with buying. There's not a lot of stuff that I buy blind. There's not a lot of stuff that I just jump into and um, buy a whole bunch of volumes without really knowing anything about it. Either I've already watched the anime or I've already um, become acquainted with the manga. I've known the manga via um, legal digital means um, or it's, it's also something that like I know the creator so I'm more likely to enjoy it. That's how I typically buy things, right? But Every so often there are titles that I do maybe even like, I really enjoy. It's not inherently a reflection on the quality of the story. And in fact, I think this this video is going to be a little bit controversial because there is some very beloved titles in this unhole pile. Uh, but, but... They're just not ones that I can see myself rereading um, at all and, or that soon into the future. And it's not something I have to have, must have um, in on my shelves. And if I do want to read it, read it, there are digital options. There's other ways to read them uh, for a lot of these. So I'm not, I don't feel like I'm missing out necessarily. Um, but yeah, so rather than spend too long on this intro, I'll get straight into it, and I hope you guys enjoy. Starting off with an older Shoujo Beat title, I do enjoy this one. It hasn't aged perfectly, although I did enjoy it quite a bit when I read it in its entirety. It's not a perfect series, but it's, uh, considering the subject matter that it covers, it is done with quite a bit of nuance, despite, as I say, not having aged that gracefully. Um, I like all of the characters in this, or majority of the characters in this. I really do like the series a lot, but this is one that, you know, I've enjoyed, I've reread it, I've had my time with it. And I have actually, well, with a lot of these titles, I've actually found new homes for them already. So um, I hope that it finds itself in a place with people who are, you know, more, um, more excited, more ready to value these series than just sitting on the shelf here with me. Uh, so this first series is Ottoman um, by Ayakano. This is an 18 volume series about a guy, teenage boy, who is very um, interested he, interested in hobbies that are generally considered tradi traditionally female um, interests. He likes really cute things, he's really into baking and needlework sewing. Um, he's just, you know, he's very much uh, a gentle soul, but his mother is very adamant in him being like the epitome of a manly man. Uh, he's the head of his kendo club, I think it is. Um, and he's, you know, top athlete, great grades, 
Um, he was a very handsome, popular guy at school. Again, mainly due to his mother's encouragement, but secretly he harbors this interest in um, the more cute and sweet side of life. His mother has a lot of personal trauma, um, which led to the, the breakdown of her marriage from this main character's father so after he came out as a trans woman. So, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that the whole trans woman element is done pretty well, or at least handled with some nuance later on when it becomes more relevant to the story. The, mm. And so this is a romance between our main character, this high school boy who likes cute things, and a teenage girl, one of his classmates, who isn't interested in... I mean, she's beautiful, she's quite popular, but she's absolutely, like, athletic, doesn't really have any... doesn't care about sticking to, like, femininity. Her, her father, or her family, runs a dojo, I think, and so she's been trained in all sorts of martial arts, and she's very physically strong as well as mentally strong and with the encouragement uh, of her and some other um, friends in their their class he this our main character is able to become more comfortable with accepting the the less stereotypical side of himself um, and so there's multiple male characters with quote-unquote female interests in this series as I said and I do I did always enjoy the series and how it made it okay for cisgendered straight guys to be comfortable with again hobbies that are seen as more typically female um yeah female interests sewing cooking makeup is another one um and it handled it like it was okay, it was totally normal to be into those sorts of things, that you're not broken, you're not bad. And also, in addition to the counterpoint with the trans character and that background, and again, how just because you like something that's feminine or not too stereotypically seen to be appropriate or um, interesting to your assigned gender doesn't mean that you are inherently trans, but then also sometimes it does. Some people are trans. That's just a fact of life. Um, it, I thought it was a good series. I did enjoy it. I like Ayakano's work. I love her current series, Requiem of the Rose King. Um, but again, it's one that I've I've had, I've enjoyed, I've reread a couple times, and it's sweet and lovely, but just not really something I need or want in the collection anymore. So I'm glad that someone else seems to be really keen to, to get their hands on this and it's, it's found a new home already. Another shoujo beat title, this one is very recent in fact, and I'm not, again, um, I'm just stopping collecting this physically. I think I'm going to be picking up the digital editions for this series because I like it. It's really great. It does um, everything that it needs to <laughs> very, very well. It's not, it's not original whatsoever, but the execution of the series is very, very good. Um, but it's just, I have so many ongoing series right now in physical editions that I need to kind of reassess <laughs> what I'm picking up physically versus digitally. And this one I'm perfectly happy to um, jump onto a digital alternative rather than, than buying the physical copies. Um, yeah, so this is one, again, that I really like. It's not bad or anything like that, but that is uh, Prince Freya. And I have two volumes of this. Um, so this is Keiko Ishihara's ongoing shoujo series about a teenage girl who is, through circumstance, kind of forced to become the stand-in for the prince of her, her, I guess, country, uh, who dies an untimely death and looked incredibly uh, uncannily similar to our main character. And it's her whole struggle of um, becoming this prince, uh, presenting herself 
as him and, uh, you know, encourage the her countrymen um, and avoid war with neighboring countries and her maturing, growing up, and becoming a stronger person through this process, uh, as, l as well as romantic elements and things like that as well. It's a solid little series. It's one that was recommended to me by my very good friend, Ray, from Whimsical Pictures. Um, and it is. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, but it is one that I'm more comfortable, or I, I'm happy to go to digital versus physical just because I'm not sure at this point as I, I've only read two volumes I will say but I'm not sure at this point whether or not it's one that I will reread a lot and want to like re-experience over and over and over again it may just be one of those series where I've read it once I enjoyed it it was really good but you know, I that's it. <laughs> it's a one and done type of thing for me. And that's the vibe that I'm getting currently. And things may change in the future. As I said, I'm I will still be following it uh, digitally, but as for right now, that's where I'm sitting on it. And yeah, next is a ongoing older um, Shonen Jump. Well, it's a Shonen series, I think. Uh, it, it's put out by Shonen Jump in English, uh, but I think this is currently in a monthly magazine. I haven't read this series for a long time, and I actually dug out these volumes a while ago. I put them in, like, boxes and just kind of forgot about them um, for a long time, which is maybe an indication that <laughs> I don't need them with me anymore. And this is another series that I can read via the Jump app if I really, really want to revisit it. And this is another series that I've already found a home for. And that is D. Grey Man um, by Katsura Hoshino. I have 25 of the 26 volumes of this. Um, it's a series that I think, like a lot of people love D. Grey Man. I watched the first, like the original 50-ish episodes that Funimation put out on DVD. Um, I used to own the DVDs. It's a series that was kind of early on, the anime adaptation at least, was early on in my anime fandom days, but I didn't really get to the manga until quite a bit later. And the manga's good. There's a lot of really interesting elements to this series. There's a lot of really cool characters. It's got a pretty solid shonen setup, and all of the moving parts work very, very well. Uh, but there was a period in the like t middle. I don't know even how long ago ago it was. It was on hiatus for a while, or it kept going on and off of hiatus for a while. And again, Hoshino moved to a monthly magazine from a weekly magazine. And none of that's an indication of it being bad. But there's so... There's long breaks in which that I would... By the time more new stuff would come out, I would have forgotten everything leading up to that. And because it was a little bit inconsistent in the middle there, it was sometimes hard to follow or remember everything that was going on, all of the characters and their relation to each other. And I'm sure that if you, if you're just currently getting into it, you sit down and reading it front, like beginning to end, then you won't have that problem. And it's not that I've like forgotten all of the characters and forgotten the entire situation or anything, but it is one that despite being something from pretty early on in my I guess, anime and manga career, quote-unquote. It's one that wasn't ever really that nostalgic for me. It wasn't a series that I absolutely fell in love with when a lot of other series that I was um, reading at the same time or watching at the same time became absolute favorites um, and absolute, like, very dear series to myself um, that I talk about constantly, endlessly. <laughs> And again, it's not to say that D. Grey Man is bad. I wouldn't ever say that. And it does a lot of good things really, really well. But it is one that for me is a little bit forgettable, a little bit convoluted. And when it's great, it's phenomenal. 
when it's like in the less great parts of it, it's somewhat forgettable or somewhat muddled or somewhat kind of tripping over its own feet. Um, and maybe once it's ended, who knows when that will be, maybe once it's ended I will give the whole series a reread um, and kind of reconnect or uh, re, I guess rejuvenate my experience with it. But for right now, that's not something that I have the time for, for one, and that isn't really high on my priorities. It is one that I probably will be following digitally in the future if there's more. I know there's a volume 27 come out in Japan. I don't know if it's come out here. It's been a long time since I bought an indie gray man. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a very good series. It's, it's a solid shonen action series about a young boy called, what's his name? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, what is his name? Alan! Alan Walker um, has joined this society of exorcists because to, I mean, exorcise demons and, uh, yeah, I guess corrupted souls um, around a kind of gothic or... Uh, steampunk-ish version of Victorian England and or Europe, I guess, and, along with his other co-workers, various exorcists, and uh, trying to prevent the... some sort of... there's a biblical reference, the second... the Noah's Ark group, um, who's trying to, I guess, cause the second extinction of humanity, something along those lines. Um, and there's a whole bunch of uh, quote-unquote bad guys called the Noah uh, who work for this guy who's like the main villain. Um, and then there's a, all of those characters have various reasons as to why they're doing the things that they do and perhaps Alan is closer to the situation than he realizes and, you know, other mysteries and things are going on. It's, as I said, it's good if you like action, if you like these kind of, um, yeah, steampunkish kind of dark gothic, uh, action series, then you'll probably enjoy it. And I do enjoy it, but it's not something that is, you know, near and dear to my heart currently at this point. Um, so yeah, D. Gray Man, another, another series that I am finding a new home form and has actually found a new home so that shall be uh, going to them today or tomorrow. First for the controversial picks <laughs> um, for leaving the collection is a series that again I, I really love. I think it's really funny and sweet and lovely. Um, it's recently in Japan got a new volume um, which is big news because it's been a long time since the most recent volume was that one in English? I don't remember. Um, so this is the one that comes out very, very slowly, but is m much beloved. And again, I love it a lot too, but I do think that a uh, digital version would be more, uh, just more convenient for me. Something that I can um, go back to without having to track it down on my shelves. And... I find comedies as well kind of, um, I don't know, I don't know, there's something about it that I don't mind if they're not on the shelf, if that makes sense. Um, but this is Yotsuba, or Yotsuba and, uh, by, uh, Kiyohiko Azuma, the same creator as Azumanga Daio, which is a series that I never personally was, like, really in love with. I didn't find it funny <laughs> or anything. Um, but Yotsuba is really great. I do love Yotsuba a lot. This, again, isn't a testament to the quality of the series. More so just my space priorities and my reading preferences. And because it is such a slow release, um, just yeah, making that transition to a digital collection versus the physical books 
Um, but this is the story of a young girl, Yotsuba, who's four years old, her and her adoptive father, who I think is a journalist? He's some sort of writer. And basically all of the funny hijinks that she gets <laughs> gets through over her various friendships and adventures around her neighborhood. Um, she's quite close with the their their direct neighbors, the the three sisters and mother of the family next door. Um, many of her father's friends and colleagues as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's not much more than that. Uh, Yosuba is a very charming, likable, silly, goofy character. The series makes me laugh a lot, which is sometimes difficult to pin down for a comedy manga for me. I'm very particular. Um, it's a great series. It is really, really wonderful. I do highly recommend it. Um, it's just not one for on my shelves right now. And that may change in the future, but I just don't have the space for it. And I, the, the reading experience is not, like, I don't think it's negatively impacted with the digital reading experience. I don't think you necessarily need, the, the art is simplistic, the jokes, um, which helps the jokes, don't get me wrong. And the art is lovely, like, it's not bad art, but it's not something that, has a like highly detailed, um, very involved level of artistry, um, insofar as like backgrounds and character designs and all th sorts of things like that. Um, so it's it's not really an issue uh, for me with reading reading digitally, but it's it's very good. I do recommend this series very highly, <laughs> um, but. As to whether you want it digitally or physically is, of course, up to you. And for me, I'm making that choice to make the switch. And this, again, is a very wonderful series and is a series that has since found its home. Um, this is not, um, you know, it's not sitting waiting to be sold or anything. I've found someone who wants this and I'm very glad that and very happy that more people are able to read it. Next is another series that, again, I really like. I've, I've enjoyed it, um, and I really appreciate the impact that this series has had. Uh, this creator, it's his only available work in English, which is a shame considering how influential his stuff is in Japan. Um, but it's not a series that I'm probably going to revisit anytime soon, and it is, for me, one of those series that is like, I've read it, I enjoyed it, I'm probably not going to read it again. Um, who knows, again, who knows if that'll change in the future, but that's where I'm sitting on it right now. It is one that I do recommend, especially if you like, uh, sp like character drama and sports series, and that is Cross Game by Mitsuru Arachi. This is a 17 volume series that has been collected in eight uh, omnibus editions from Viz, and this is a story of a high school boy who um, really, well, he plays baseball. When he was much younger, um, the he had like this friendship slash romance with a girl his same age, who was the middle daughter of three sisters, or the, the middle sister of three sisters, um, from the local batting, uh, batting cages, I guess, or batting center. I don't, I'm not a sports person. Where you go to hit baseballs with the machine. I don't, <laughs> whatever it's called. Um, so there's an older sister, there's the middle sister, and there's actually two younger sisters, and one who's a year younger, and then one who's quite a bit younger, maybe five or six years younger. Um, so he, he, he's, you know, best friend slash romantically involved with, or in love with maybe, uh, the, the second daughter of these sisters, um, you know, the second sister of these sisters. Uh, but unfortunately, tragically, she dies, uh, when they're both 11 or 12 years old. And 
Uh, so it's partially about his grief and his connection to baseball and her expectations or admiration for him in baseball and how that's kind of fueled his continuance of it over the past five or six years, um, as well as his very complicated relationship with the sisters now, um, especially the third sister who's only a year younger than um, he was and is, um, and, and sort of their kind of back and forth love-hate relationship there, um, and pretty general baseball sports stuff. They they want to, you know, obviously improve and, and get competition level stuff. And then also the, the third sister, um, who is a phenomenal uh, baseball player in her own right, but their school doesn't have a baseball team. And so kind of the gender discrepancy of how sports are handled between male and female teams. It's very, very good. It's wonderful. Like, it's a phen- it's a great series. I love the series a lot, but it's not one that, um, again, I have space for right now. Um, it's one that I've found a new home for already, so that's, I'm, again, glad to, to have more people reading it. But if you are wanting a sports series from kind of the, the grandfather of baseball manga in Japan, then you should absolutely read Cross Game. It is very, 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 very good. Next is another series that I'm going to be reading digitally just because, well, I don't need this in print. It's not something that, like, it's funny and it's fun, but I don't need it as a book on my shelf, right? It's, it's good, but it's not you know, brilliant. It's not, uh, well, I mean, it's funny. It's definitely relatable at parts. Um, and that is the, I think this is ongoing, maybe completed in Japan with four volumes. Um, but Little Miss P by Ken Koyama, which is a manga about a personified or anthropomorphized period, um, or menstruation perhaps is, another way to phrase that. Um, so Little Miss P is obviously uh, <laughs> this this strange creature um, which is meant to be representative of menstruation and how Little Miss P impacts various people's lives, uh, both men and women, emotionally, physically, um, and all, everything in between. It's very, very funny. Um, there's a lot of other characters, uh, like, like, is it puberty? There's a couple, like, other characters as well, along with Little Miss P. Um, anthropomorphized characters, not human characters. So there is quite a bit going on. Um, and I think it's, like, it's a fun allegory uh, for everyone who menstruates. I think there's a, definitely a part of tr- truth in a lot of these, um, short stories or collections. Um, this has two volumes, I think, in English currently, and or I don't know if the third one's come out. I do have the first two. Um, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. It's very funny. Um, I, and I liked the different perspectives on how sometimes menstruation can be a great thing. Um, <laughs> when, if you get your period after you've been worried about it, not, not being around, um, and how much of a relief that can be. And then the, I guess, more common, uh, experience of just being like really put out about it, upset, um, not feeling your best, moody, hormonal, etc., etc. Um, and how that can obviously impact, um, individuals' lives. Not only women and, and, uh, those who menstruate, but also their partners and the people around them. And just this pervasive, um, I guess, toxicity in how people talk about menstruation and, and women's behavior or people's behavior when they're, they're menstruating. It's, it's good. It's good. I do enjoy it. But it is one that's, again, kind of a one and done 
type of read for me. It's not one that I can see myself revisiting over and over again. And if I have it on the Kindle or whatever, I can revisit it um, if I need feel the need to, like, chuckle morbidly over it. It's like, yep, that's relatable. Um, <laughs> but not one that I need to dedicate shelf space to. The Little Miss P is very good if you like this kind of absurdist uh, female or, um, yeah, focused maybe. Um, or, me yeah, I, I mean, I don't hate to call this woman issues because it is more than women that menstruate, but that these kinds of series where it is a bit more of an unexplored viewpoint. Um, so, yeah. I mean, if that sounds interesting to you, I do definitely recommend it. Um, again, just your prerogative of whether you want to go digital or physical with it. Uh, next is a one-shot. Um, this is an autobiographical manga. And this is one that deals, again, with uh, quote-unquote women's issues. And I wanted to like this. I didn't like this, so that's why I'm not going to be keeping it. Um, and that is I Don't Know How to Give Birth by Ayami Kazuma. This is a single volume about a expectant mother or who obviously doesn't really know much about pregnancy or birth because she's never experienced it before. And prior to um, her marriage and her relationship with her husband, she never even really thought about it. Um, so I, I always do keep in mind, and I try to always emphasize when you talk about autobiographical manga, um, it is about a personal experience. And so it's an exploration of that person's feelings, that person's life, that person's reactions to things. And it is wonderful. Like, no people, sh no one person should be emblematic of every experience that has ever been. That's just not how life works, right? Um, and for me, like, I'm not someone, like, I've never been pregnant. I'm currently not planning on pregnancy. I do, like, hope to someday be a parent, but it's not, like, I don't, I'm not thinking about it right now, <laughs> right? Um, and so I thought this might be a fun kind of anecdotal look at that a first pregnancy of all the ups and downs of how like media glamorizes pregnancy and then versus the reality of it. And there's definitely elements of that. But our main character, uh, Kazuma Sensei herself, I don't know. Like initially I felt very much like why was she wanting to be pregnant? Because for her, the way she explains it is that she never really wanted kids or never regarded it as an important thing. And then it was only after her husband mentioned it that she's like, okay, I want to be pregnant so he's happy. And I mean, absolutely, relationships are a compromise, but she didn't feel like she was doing like having a baby because she wanted a baby she was having a baby because she wanted her partner to be happy because he wanted a baby and it was just like really kind of off-putting and weird and like uncomfortable and then there sadly these this couple or I don't know sadly is quite the right word but they have a lot of problems a lot of issues getting pregnant so they go through a lot of um, treatments, you know, IVF and things like that, um, to try and get pregnant. So it's a multi-year thing. And I think over that period of, like, having to try and failure and lots of different, um, you know, types of trying to get this baby, that she is able to come more to terms of, like, wanting to want the baby herself, which is good. Good. But do even, like, I don't know, the husband, the way he presented it seemed quite blasé, maybe. Like, 
does he really want the responsibility of a child or does he just like the idea of having kids around? I don't know. It's weird. And then, I, like, I appreciate that this, this author wasn't inherently a very nurturing person, wasn't inherently very mothering. She had a lot of fears that many first-time mothers have about not knowing if she'll be able to connect with a child, not knowing if she'd be able to handle a baby, and the physical changes in her body, and how that affects her emotionally, mentally, her relationship with her husband, etc, etc. I think there's a lot of good in here, but the characters themselves, like, again, I it was just kind of unsettling, or not, like, I don't, I just feel like if you want to, like, if you bring a child into this world, it has to be with a bit more um, intent than just, okay, well, we should have a baby because we're married and kids are cute, or my partner wants kids, I don't really care that much, so therefore sh we should have kids because I like my partner being happy. May everybody has different reasons for wanting to be a parent, but I think, like, children are a huge responsibility, right? And they're not pets, they're people, they are human beings. So, as a parent, or as an individual, you need to be very acutely aware of that, because they, they're, it, yeah, it's, it just kind of makes me worried <laughs> about children who come from families where their parents may resent the fact that they have a kid in three years after they stop being a cute baby or after they stop being like a cute toddler or elementary school student or even initially really dislike them because babies are needy and can't take out care of them, you're their only pr provider, and are kind of gross and stinky, and you know, there's a lot, they're very involved. So I feel like, well, obviously for a lot of people, anyone can have a baby, and that's a good thing for life. Like, we don't want to be screening necessarily, like, who's allowed to have, like, reproduce, because then we get into weird eugenic stuff. Let's not do that. Uh, but I do think that it's as a responsibility of a parent to want that child, <laughs> right? It's not... I don't think that's a controversial statement to say, right? I think that's maybe pretty reasonable. And there was elements of this that I was like, I don't know if you people want a baby or you just like the idea of having a family or you think that a baby will be cute um, rather than, you know, actually wanting the responsibility of a child. So, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm completely off base with that and I don't like to assume anything about strangers that I don't know. Uh, but this was, the, I didn't, I didn't really like this book. I didn't, I didn't like it. And so I am getting rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Another controversial series, uh, or at least another controversial unhaul. It's a beloved series. It's a very popular series. I love this series. Um, but it's also one that, um... Yeah, okay, so this is this is Monster by Naoki Urasawa, um, re-released in these nine perfect editions, two-in-one editions, um, and I, I love Monster. It's one of my favorites of Urasawa's. Um, personally, I just, as, I feel like Monster, like with 20th Century Boys, kind of, because it's so long, it kind of meanders a little bit. It could be tighter. There's a lot that could be trimmed to um, be a little bit more succinct. And again, not that this series is bad. In fact, I, as I said, it's probably one of my favorite from Urasawa. Um, but, 
but I own the anime adaptation. Uh, I own the Australian DVD release of the show, which is a pretty much one-for-one -one adaptation. Like, it is almost exactly the same panel for panel, and that <laughs> doesn't take up a foot of shelf space or whatever it is. It doesn't take up a lot of room. Um, and so I'm happy to, to to choose the adaptation over the original. I've read it. Um, if I want to revisit the story, I have the DVDs for that. And it's pretty much the same experience except for with voice acting and music and pretty colors. Um, and the, the, mu the tension and mystery is even better with the show, personally, just because of those musical cues and perf vocal performances and things like that. Um, yeah. It, again, not that this series is bad, it absolutely isn't, but it's just one that I, I'm happy with the anime and I don't need the manga because of that. Um, yeah, and this is another one that I've already found a home for, so it's not, you know, I'm not missing out, and it's not going to be hanging around for overly long either. I do I do recommend it. If you haven't watched A Red Monster, it's about a neurosurgeon in uh, the... Well, it starts when he is a neurosurgeon at a hospital, obviously. And uh, this is pre... Uh, yeah, this is during the, the separation of Berlin, so prior to the Berlin Wall, wall falling, um, and our, our main character, Dr. Tenma, just makes a decision to save the life of a little boy who had been shot in the head versus the town mayor, and as such, he saves the life of this little boy. Um, and I think that, I don't remember if the mayor dies, it doesn't really matter, but, um, so he saves the life of this little boy, and, you know, goes on living the rest of his life. Because of that, he loses any chance of promotion, he kind of loses his upwards momentum, because his, his superiors wanted him to operate on the the mayor obviously that would have been like a lot more of a more politically safe move for him to do but he he didn't want to a child to die because of petty politics anyway 20 years later or something i think it's 20 years later um it is now the late 90s early 2000s something along those lines the Berlin has once again uh, conjoined. It's been a long time coming, but uh, our main character discovers that the, the boy that he saved 20 years ago has now become a sociopathic serial killer and is going around murdering people. And so being the one who saved this child's life uh, when he was a child, um, Dr. Tenma now sees it as his responsibility that he's killing people, and so he decides to go on a vigilante mission to stop uh, this this young man called Johan from murdering people. Um, and he he gets in contact with Johan's twin sister, who is the other one, uh, the other person to survive the attack that um, that night that Johan had gotten shot. Uh, so it's the two of them trying to stop a crazed killer, um, and it's very good. It's a great mystery thriller, um, suspense series. I love it a lot, but again, it's one that I'm, I, I'll watch the anime for if I'm wanting to, to revisit it. But I do recommend it. Again, it is a great series. Finally, another really wonderful series, another controversial unhaul, I'm sure, um, and that is Blade of the Immortal by Hiroaki Samura. This is a the omnibus edition from Dark Horse. Again, uh, this one is, has already found a new home, and uh, this is one that I enjoy a lot. I like Samura's work a lot. Um, there, I prefer these these 
um, omnibus editions to the current deluxe editions that Dark Horse are putting out. Um, uh, so it's not like I'm upgrading quote unquote to those. I don't want those. <laughs> I think they're ugly looking, but that's just me. Um, but this is a series that as I, I enjoyed it a lot. I think Summer has really strong female characters. I like all a lot of the characters in here in the series. I liked the plot progression. There's a lot of really wonderful moments and a lot of really interesting evolution of character um, throughout the series. But I've read it and I'm like it's it's one that I don't see myself revisiting. Um, it's I I read it. I really loved it for what it was, but it didn't change my life. It didn't like make me want to keep this and reread this 400 times, um, which other series do. Like, I have many series that do do that for me. And it was a wonderful, like, really interesting, compelling journey through the course of the series. But it's over, and I'm satisfied. And uh, again, I just probably will never revisit it. It's... I mean, you can call my taste trash for as much as you want for that opinion, but that's just my personal experience with it. And so that's why for this series, I'm, you know, I'm happy to find it a new home. It doesn't have to sit on the shelf here with me. Um, but I do, as I said, I do really like these omnibus editions from Dark Horse. They are very lovely. I never had an issue with reading them, like breaking the spine or losing pages. I know some people seem... Some people seem to have issues with Omnibus that I never have, like, ever. I don't know what people do to their books, honestly. Um, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Blade of the Immortal is very, very good. Um, I do think it's worth reading. Um, just for me, it, I don't know if it's worth owning. Um, so this is the story of... Oh my goodness, what is his name? Uh, I'm gonna have to check... <laughs> Um, do you not tell me what his name is? Oh my goodness. Well, it's the... <laughs> it's the story of this guy. <laughs> this guy who has immortality, um, and he is... Uh, he's notorious for having killed 10,000 people during life prior to his immortality. No, a thousand people. A thousand people, um before he became immortal. He gained immortality um, shortly thereafter, and in order to get, I guess, retribution and uh, penance for all of the people he murdered and the untimely death of his younger sister, he pledges to save 10,000 people with his sword um, for going into the future. So... Killed a thousand people, um, became immortal, now wants to save a thousand people. And so he becomes the bodyguard of this young girl, uh, well, teenage girl, Rin, who's this girl on the cover here, who is trying to get revenge against the uh, part some particular sword school um, who murdered her, her parents right in front of her uh, two or three years prior. Um, she's wanting to destroy the group entirely, but also uh, kill the, the leader with her own hand. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's that. That's that story. Um, it's a, it's a dark, gritty, violent, um, very, very bleak at times journey of revenge and um, grief and the changing the changing society in Japan as well the transition from like the samurai era to a more modern day um where swordsmanship and samurai are no longer really needed and then how that is reflected in these more traditional uh, sword schools and groups of people. It's it's good. It's good. 
Samara is very good at the, these types of stories. As I said, it has a really interesting cast of characters. It's one that you, I think you see your opinion shifting a lot with regards to certain characters over the course of the series, um, which is always refreshing when you kind of reassessing your feelings after you become, um, you learn more about characters or you become more insightful into, or in, yeah, to the, uh, the entire situation, which is a sign of a good writer. Samara is definitely a great writer and a great character creator. Um, and again, I, I enjoyed this a lot. It's just probably a one-time experience for me. I don't see myself revisiting it um, with any immediacy or frequency. And I per like I personally enjoy some of Samara's book other books more, uh, most notably his current work, Wave Listen to Me, uh, which I find funnier, for one. <laughs> um, and obviously very different setting, very different premise, uh, and very different types of characters, but I mean, he, he he's very, very good at what he does. He is a great writer. Um, but yeah, Blade of the Immortal is is something that I definitely enjoyed. So I, I'm really happy that I had the opportunity to read it. I do think that it was a really smart idea for Dark Horse to reissue this series in its multiple formats. Uh, but yeah, for right now, it's... um. This, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> I don't need this with me. Those were all the series that I'm unhauling for this month and for probably the large portion of this year. There's not too many more series that I'm hoping to let go of or thinking of letting go of um, too soon with the collection. Again, because it's I already, I have such... I'm really happy with my collection. I have such a good relationship with everything or majority of things that are in my collection. So there's not too much fat to cut, if, as it were. Um, and even, I mean, in this pack, stack of books, most of the series I really enjoy. Some I'm continuing to follow just in a different format and others I'm just, you know, passing on because I've, read it, enjoyed it, and I know that I'm probably not going to revisit it. Um, which is a personal thing versus, you know, it being bad or it being infuriating or it being, you know, better or worse than something else. So, yeah, obviously all of these, everything I said and everything I always say on this channel is my personal opinion. Um, and I, just to reiterate, just if you love these series, if there are something that are very near and dear to you, that's phenomenal. I I wish you the best with that. And I, again, there's there's one book in this whole pile that I said that I don't like. So it's not like I don't agree with with people who may think that you know they are worth owning or they are really wonderful series that they want in their collection or that they have in their collection. Um, I just don't, like, I literally just don't have the space. If I had infinite space and resources, then I would own every single thing that I've ever read that's available in print. But that's not how life works. <laughs> I don't have that. And honestly, I wouldn't want that because having too much kind of makes me anxious. Um, I don't need a massive library of every everything that I've ever read and enjoyed or um, maybe not enjoyed, kind of had mildly good feelings about. Um, so yeah, that's... Unhauling has always been a pretty large part of my channel and my collection uh, experience, I guess. It's something that I do encourage people to do, especially if you feel like you've been burnt out on series or you've been burnt out on collecting, just trying to keep up to date with all of the books that you're following, all of the series that just keep being released. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a never ending thing. And as wonderful as it is being 
currently a manga fan in that we just have so much available. So many titles are being released. It is impossible to keep up with everything. And just because you like something doesn't mean you have to hold on to it and hoard it and cling to it for the rest of your life. Um, I, I see physical goods, physical products, printed books as emblematic as to what I want around me. I, I want my collection to be something that I'm enjoying, that I'm happy to see and explore and um, experience pretty much every day versus having this anxious pressure of, oh my goodness, there I'm following 37 new series, there's all of these books coming out, there's so many more new titles coming out and finishing, and I don't know where to even start with this, and I haven't read everything, and my to-read pile is through the roof. I don't like that in my life. I don't want my hobby to stress me out, right? Um, and this is a part of my process as de of de-stressing my hobby experience, um, which of course everyone has their own personal collecting habits and I think, you know, there's pros and cons to all of them. Um, but yeah, I let me know if you've ever unhauled or gotten rid of or decluttered maybe um, your own collection, whether it be anime, manga, uh, another hobby as well. Um, and your experience with that, whether you regretted it, whether that was a sense of relief for you, whether you in the moment were really happy about getting rid of something, but then um, later down the line repurchased it and maybe then went through that cycle again of like, do I really like this? Maybe I should get rid of this. Um, sometimes that happens and that's not a bad thing either. Um, and also how your collection reflects yourself currently, um, your maturity, your nostalgia, the series that are important to you for various parts of your life, um, regardless of quality. <laughs> so yeah, I love hearing people's stories of that and maybe I hope this has encouraged others to reassess their collection, see what's important to them, see what they want to keep what they want to uh, find a new home for or donate. Donations are great, a great thing. I think especially if we want to keep manga, I fandom maybe, manga readers alive. Uh, it's starting to introduce for like, okay, I'm not explaining myself correctly, but I feel like a lot of early manga fans or people just getting into the hobby do discover manga through libraries and through secondhand stores and things like that where it's cheap and accessible. Um, and, and if you do donate, whether it, to be, whether it be to an op shop or a secondhand media store or whatever else, that's an opportunity for someone else to discover a series that maybe you love and but don't have room for or maybe you really enjoyed at 15, but now you're 35 and you're like, oh, that's not really something I'm that into anymore. And now a new 15 year old can find it and fall in love with it. And that's how we foster this community. That's how we encourage people to discover this wonderful, this wonderful medium. Um, and I, so that's always what I keep in mind. Um, because manga should never be like an investment, right? It should never be something you're hoping to make hundreds of dollars on in the out of print market because manga doesn't retain value. It just straight up doesn't. Um, there's very few rare series that are at exorbitant prices, but they're not actually worth that. And scalpers are just opportunists. Um, really, I, and I mean, this is a, shouldn't come to a sh as a shock to anybody who followed my channel, but you should be in this hobby because you enjoy reading comics. No other reason, right? You should be in this hobby um, because you enjoy reading comics and you enjoy supporting, legally supporting those comics, those creators, 
and the people who make them available to us in English-speaking countries or wherever you're from. Uh, you shouldn't be in this hobby because you're wanting to make an investment for to be able to down pay a house because that is not gonna happen. You should not be in this hobby because you want clout over someone else because you own more books than they do. You should not be in this hobby because you want to lord it over younger, more, like, y younger fans who aren't as knowledgeable or aren't as, um, you know, invested in the hobby or in various series as you are. You should just be in, the, you should be a manga reader, manga fan, in the, <laughs> because you like reading comics. That's the end, like, that's the full stop of that. It's... <laughs> I don't know why I need to explain that, but I feel like sometimes people need to hear that. And, yeah, uh, it's, again, you shouldn't... I've, your goal shouldn't be to have the biggest collection in the world unless you're really wanting to get into Guinness World Records. But even that's not really a true, uh, true measure of anything because you got to pay to get in that. Uh, it's just... Yeah... <laughs> it's such a huge community, such a diverse community with so many different titles for so many different types of people and different groups that make sure that what you own is stuff that you want to own, not just stuff you want to have because other people tell you you should have it or because other people say that you should enjoy this. Um, take responsibility for your own enjoyment is perhaps the message of that story. Um, but yeah, I'm going to stop ranting <laughs> about this. I hope you all enjoyed. I hope um, you will catch me in my next video. As always, I will link my Twitter and such down below subscribe if you haven't and you did enjoy this video. I do appreciate it and I will catch you in the next video. Bye till then.